Yes, we're on page 851 of your Pew Bibles, beginning at verse 13 of chapter 3 of Malachi. Your words against me are harsh, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What have we gained by keeping his requirements and walking mournfully before the Lord of armies? So now we consider the arrogant to be fortunate. Not only do those who commit wickedness prosper, they even test God and escape. At that time, those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. The Lord took notice and listened. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and had high regard for his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of armies, my own possession on the day I am preparing. I will have compassion on them as a man has compassion on his son who serves him. So you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For look, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will be stubble. The coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root or branches. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the stall. You will trample the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day I am preparing, says the Lord of armies. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray before we look at that passage. Father in heaven, without your work in us, your word is darkness to us. Help us this day shine light into our minds and our hearts. Illuminate your word and by your power use it to change us, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the last few weeks, Malachi has helped us watch on as God and his people hold a conversation about how their relationship is going. You'll remember that God initiated this relationship. He chose Abraham and his descendants. He loved Jacob and hated Esau. And in the desert, God and his people Israel made an agreement. They both made commitments in a covenant. Now, hundreds of years later, God initiates the discussion we have here in Malachi. He does this at a time when his people are failing to keep their part of that agreement that they made in the desert. His people, the people he has chosen, the people he has saved, the people he has given a land to, they are not serving him. They're not fearing him. They're not honouring him as they committed to do so in that covenant. Now, as we've listened in on this conversation, we've seen God's people question God in a number of ways. They've questioned his love for them. We've seen them try to get away with offering less than their best to him. We've seen God's people doubt their identity as his. We've seen them doubt even that he cares for them at all. And we've also seen them doubt that he's concerned about justice being done. So how do you think this relationship's going? How would any relationship be going where one party continually failed to trust the other? Where one party failed to do what they had said they would do? God's being faithful. His people are doubting him and not doing as they said they would. Two different parties behaving totally differently. This relationship is not in a good way. And as a result of all that, this relationship is not fulfilling one of its main purposes. It's meant to show the world how good it is to be God's people how good God himself is, and it just isn't doing it. 
And last week we heard the latest step in this little saga. We heard God's people again doubting him. And they're doubting his provision for them in this case. And so, a bit like not giving him their best, they're keeping back a bit for themselves, just in case, just in case God doesn't provide. God has promised to give them what they need, but they just want to make sure they'll be all right. They're not trusting him, are they? So the statement that begins our passage today follows on from that lack of trust in God's provision. Let's have a look at it. In verse 13, God says, Your words against me are harsh. And the people reply, What have we spoken against you? God has heard them say, It's useless to serve God. What have we gained? What have we gained by keeping his requirements and walking mournfully before the Lord of armies? They're the words of a people who fail to see any value in being in this relationship. As far as they can see, they're not gaining anything. They're strange words to hear from a people immediately after God has said in verse 10 of chapter 3, test me, see what I will do, trust me, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour down blessing until there is no more need. And yet the people say, what have we gained? Yet the people say, the arrogant around us, they're fortunate, the wicked around us, they prosper. They appear to test you, God, and then they go unpunished. How blind they are. How short their memory. How little they know their God and how little they value their relationship with him. Back in chapter 1, verse 6 of Malachi, God said to the people, A son honours his father and his servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honour? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? The covenant relationship has those two aspects. The love of sons, the fear of the master. Where is God's honour? Where is our fear of him? Now here in verses 14 through 16, those two aspects are again picked up. Honouring God and fearing God. The people are questioning, why serve God? There's no gain in it for us. And they're demonstrating by their murmuring against God the words they speak to each other. They don't fear him or honour him. The words they speak among ourselves, themselves, what have we gained? Where's the gain in serving God? His people are not showing to the world how good it is to be God's people. They're murmuring against him. And they're not only not showing to the world how good God's people are, they're actually undermining those around them who are meant to be trusting God and meant to be part of the community showing how good it is to be his people. Look at the arrogant and the wicked. They're getting ahead. Why trust a God that lets them prosper? Murmur, 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 murmur. The words we speak to each other are important. The continual imperative through Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy and much of the Old Testament is to remember. Remember what God has done and remember the commitment you made as his people. 
The whole of Deuteronomy 8 says, remember, remember, remember. They are to remember as individuals and as a community. Yet here the exact opposite is happening. Instead of remembering, the people are looking around at what is going on right at this moment and saying, there's no gain in serving God. What a contrast. In our other reading today, Jesus emphasises, in Matthew 12, Jesus emphasises the words we, where the words we speak come from. How can you speak good things when you are evil? From the mouth, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. A good, good person produces good things from his storeroom of good, and an evil person produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. Our words reflect our hearts. Where is our heart? What is our words? So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what words do we speak to each other? Do we help our brothers and sisters to remember what God has done? As we were reminded last week, God does not change. What he has done, he will do. He has been faithful. He will be faithful. He loves his people relentlessly. Always has done, always will. He provides for them. He saves them. Do we remind each other of what he is like? and how good it is to be one of his people. Jesus goes on in Matthew, Matthew 12. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. At point three in the outline, those who fear the Lord. Now there's a change. Malachi introduces us to a different group of God's people. Reading from the beginning of verse 16. At that time, those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. The Lord took notice and listened. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and had high regard for his name. Here's people speaking different words. Now, either they're a group of people who feared God all along, who've not heard from them before, or they've heard the rebuke in the words of God from Malachi and have repented of their words and their doubt. It doesn't really matter. They are people who now speak words that show they do fear their Lord. They do honour God as their Father. They have a high regard for his name. Their words to each other are truth that builds up and it helps those around them who may be doubting. The people have been suggesting, those who doubt the Lord and speak the false words, They've been suggesting that God is blind and deaf to wickedness and injustice. See here, he is not blind or deaf. He sees those who honour him and he takes note of them. And in return, he gives them great honour by renewing the promises that he makes to those who are his. They will be mine, says the Lord of Armies my own possession on the day I am preparing. I will have compassion on them as a man has compassion on his son who serves him. It's important to note that both groups of people live in the same circumstances. They still see the arrogant. They still see the wicked prospering. 
they still see the wicked test God and appear to escape unscathed. Yet they have remembered that God does love them. They have remembered that he is just. They have remembered he does not change. They have remembered he provides for his people. And so they speak words of truth about God to each other. Is that us? A few weeks ago, we made some promises to support those who are being confirmed in their faith. Will we abide by those promises, honouring God and them? Will we hold them to account for their promises? Will we pray for them? Will we encourage them and speak of God's goodness to them? So we have these two very different and separate groups of people revealed. Two groups. We have those who say there is no gain in serving God. They doubt God, speak words against him, and and they speak words against him to God and to each other. They walk mournfully before the Lord. It's such a heavy burden to keep God's requirements. Compared to them, we have those who fear the Lord, have a high regard for his name. They speak words of truth to each other that honour God and encourage those around them. They see the arrogant and the wicked around them. They know God is just. He will judge all the earth. But there's one final difference. Reading from verse 19. So you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. For look, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. Coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root or branches. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the stall. The day of the sun, S-U-N, is coming. For the wicked, the sun will be like a burning fire, furnace, and they will be consumed like inconsequential stubble. For those who fear God's name, the same sun, S-U-N, will rise with healing in its wings. The contrast could not be more stark. The wicked and the righteous will will be revealed and they'll be changed on that day. And there'll be no doubting the justice of God. There'll be no doubting whether there was any value or gain in serving and honouring him. There is another place in God's word where the rising of the sun causes the good pasture to grow for the livestock and where the worthless men are consumed. David's last words in 2 Samuel 23 speak of a just ruler, ruling in fear of God and seeing justice done. Reading from verse 2 of that chapter. This is David speaking. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. The just ruler, 
the S-U-N son who will clearly reveal the wicked and the righteous has come. And he's the son, S-O-N, of David's line. He is Jesus, our Lord. Our response to him shows who we are. Righteous, wicked. Difference is very stark here. People will either be consumed totally, root and branch, or they will go out and playfully jump like calves from a stall. Here in Australia, we don't lock our calves up for many months like they do in many parts of the world. But even at weaning time, when we lock our calves up for seven to ten days, when they are let out, it's a sight to see. They go silly. Even old cows, after they've been locked up for a while, when they're let out the gate, they jump around like some bucking bull. Brings a smile to your face to watch these old girls jump around like it is. And there are plenty of images of cows and calves and their joy and their play when they're let out of the barn. Plenty of images of that on the internet. We would like to have shown one today, but we probably need, might have infringed copyright or something. It strikes me that this life here and now is the time of being locked up. We're in our master's barn under his care. But a better life, a green pasture with the sun shining and the rain for the grass to grow awaits. Like calves born in the barn, we do not even know what life in the pasture is like. But our master, our father in heaven, has said that the day of release will come and it will be good. And in order that we would believe that, he has sent his son, S-O-N, demonstrating that his relentless love and his mercy has not dimmed. And then to prove that the good pasture waits, his S-O-N son has risen and has gone ahead to prepare it for our coming. So brothers and sisters, do you believe that you will go out and playfully jump for joy in the pasture of our Lord? This is the good God we are to speak of, the God who has given us this hope, the God who gave his son for us. Let us remember his many promises. Just in this passage, he promises that those who are his will be his possession. He promises that he will have compassion on us. He promises us healing. He promises that we will playfully jump in his pasture. May we not be the people who speak against him or doubt the value of being his. Let us praise him and rejoice in all that he is and all that he has done and all that he will do. Let me pray. Father, we have been reminded this morning of how good it is to be your people. You should be our greatest joy, Lord, and yet so often we take joy in all the other good things you give us. Father, help us. Help us to see you as you are. And Lord, be our joy. Amen.